Christian Parenting. Many young people grow up in church, but leave it behind when they become adults. Why does this happen? And what can parents do to help? We're going to talk about it today on Family Vision. Hi, my name is Emily Reno. Welcome to Family Vision, the podcast from Visionary Family Ministries, encouraging families through practical, encouraging, and real conversations. Rob Reno here with Visionary Family Ministries. Well, we're going to continue a conversation today that is sensitive, that is difficult, and is of the utmost importance. We're going to be talking about reaching prodigal kids, reaching teenagers and young adults who perhaps were raised in a church, perhaps raised in a Christian home, but for all sorts of different reasons are now no longer following the Lord. Or perhaps you came to Christ after you had raised your kids. You didn't even raise them in church because you weren't a follower of Jesus then. And now you're trying to share what God has done in your life with your adult children who may be scattered around the country or even scattered around the world. Well, in our last episode, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to that. We began this conversation with a little bit of the history and statistics and background. And we also talked about the first action step, the first biblical principle that we can apply because it is never too late. It's never too late for God to use you as mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, aunt, or uncle, no matter how old your child is, no matter how far away they live, no matter what's happened. I understand terrible things happen in relationships. Even if you're completely estranged from them, it's not too late for God to use you as a part of a miracle story with your son or with your daughter. So we're unpacking four action steps. Now, these are not magic formulas. These are not do one, two, three, four, and your kid will be following Jesus and restored to the family. But these are biblical principles, things that God says to us in the Bible that we can do as parents to spiritually bless and encourage our kids. These four principles are offer your heart to the Lord, turn your heart to your child, draw your child's heart to yours, and point your child's heart to Christ. Now, we do a deep dive into each of these principles in our book, in our video Bible study called Never Too Late, Encouraging Faith in Your Adult Child. You can find that book, that Kindle book, anywhere you get your books. Again, Never Too Late, Encouraging Faith in Your Adult Child. And of course, we have it as an individual book, a 10-pack, and that video Bible study with the workbook uh, on our website at visionaryfam.com. Well, in our last episode, we talked about this first action step, this first biblical principle of just offering our own heart to the Lord, that we can't lead our kids in a direction we're not going in ourselves. And we offer our heart to the Lord through prayer and through repentance. Well, let's talk about this next one, turning our hearts to our child or turn your heart to your child. This one comes straight from Scripture. Uh, The link between the Testaments is Malachi 4 and Luke 1. At the end of Malachi 4, that's the very last words of the Old Testament, God says, I'm going to send the prophet Elijah, and he's going to turn the hearts of fathers to their kids and the hearts of kids to their fathers. Now, uh, if you know your Bible history, Elijah has already come by the time we're in Malachi 4. This is 400 B.C., So this is a prophecy about a new prophet who will come that will come in the spirit of Elijah. He's going to be like Elijah. And the prophecy was about John the Baptist. So you go forward then to Luke chapter 1, and an angel, angel Gabriel, appears to an old man named Zechariah. Zechariah is married to a woman named Elizabeth, and she is about to be blessed with a baby in her old age, and that baby is going to grow up to be John the Baptist. So the angel Gabriel speaks to Zechariah to tell Zechariah about the baby who's on the way. So this is what the angel says. Many of the people of Israel will he, John the Baptist, soon to be growing in your wife's womb, will he bring back to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah, that's the prophecy of Malachi 4, to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous in order to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. God sent John to get the hearts of the people ready for Jesus. 
And John did it two ways, but we really only talk about one. One way he did it is he pleaded with people to repent, turn from disobedience to righteousness, humble yourself before God, prepare your hearts for the Messiah. And that one makes sense. That one sounds uh, pretty Bible-y, pretty Sunday school-y, repent, prepare for Jesus. Good. But the other thing that John did, according to the prophecy in Malachi and the words of the angel, is he pleaded with fathers to turn their hearts to their children. Now, what does that have to do with getting people ready for Jesus? The first one, repent, that makes sense. But what is this, fathers, turn your hearts to your children? Well, when the hearts of parents and grandparents are turned to their kids, let me define that. What that means is that that the parent, that the grandparent has a spiritual passion, burden, and mission for the soul of their child. They want nothing more than for their child, their grandchild, to love and follow Jesus forever. They've got a burden for their heart. That means their heart is turned to them. So when the hearts of parents are turned to their kids and the hearts of kids are turned to their parents, then then everybody's heart is turned and soft toward Father God, seeking to express his love for us through his son, Jesus. But if the hearts of parents are hard at the kids, hearts of kids hard at the parents, then everybody's heart is also hard toward whom? Father God, seeking to express his love for us through, for us through his son, Jesus. So if you want the hearts of your kids prepared for Messiah, What can you do? Turn your heart to them. Ask God to turn your heart to them. Ask God to make it the number one mission of your life to help the souls of your kids and grandkids safely home to their Father in heaven. And this is why Satan and the demons work so hard to harden the hearts of families, to harden the heart of a husband against a wife, Harden the heart of a wife against a husband, a parent to a child, a child to a parent. Why? Because the soft-heartedness or the hearts being turned to each other in a family is one of the most powerful and essential ingredients for that whole family receiving the faith and receiving the love of Father God. Now, I want to give you a very specific encouragement as it relates to this principle of turning your heart to your child no matter how old they are. And that is, I want to encourage you to pray for God to give you a heart of compassion for them. Pray for God to give you a heart of compassion for them. In Matthew 9, 36, one of my favorite scriptures about Jesus and his ministry, Jesus looks out at this crowd of souls who are lost. And the text says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And if you have a prodigal child, I wonder if that's how you see them. I wonder if you see them as harassed and and helpless, that you see them like a sheep without a shepherd. And I wonder if you have the same attitude toward them that Jesus had toward those who were lost. The scripture says he had compassion on them. Think of it this way. Let's imagine that your son or daughter is in a, a, a physical fight right? We can all agree they're in a spiritual fight. They're in a spiritual battle. And right now, if they're far from God, they're, they're losing that spiritual battle. They're getting pounded. But let's imagine it's physical. Imagine outside on the street, your son is, is in a fist fight and he's losing. He's getting pounded. His, his back is on the pavement and uh, whoever he's fighting has the upper hand raining blows down on him. As a parent, if you see your kid in a fight getting pounded, there's two things that ought to rise up in your heart. One uh, is is a righteous indignation that you want to get into that fight, that you want to physically put yourself in harm's way to help your son fight the battle, even if it means getting hurt yourself. We're going to come back to that in a little while because ministering to a prodigal child that a lot of times involves a lot of being hurt on our side. So yeah, we we would want to get it there and fight. But also, if you see your son getting pounded, beaten to a pulp, I hope your heart would be filled with compassion, filled with just sorrow for the suffering that they are going through. And, And here's the reality. We don't like to talk about this as parents, but it is possible for us to develop a very judgmental, critical spirit toward our children. 
It's possible for us to develop an angry, bitter, resentful attitude toward our children. And sometimes that happens because um, they've done things that have really hurt us. They've done things that have shamed us or embarrassed us or all sorts of different things. But the problem is because we now have this sometimes even hatred toward our own kids, that now is another ball and chain around our life, which is preventing us from ministering to them. It's preventing us from having a heart of compassion for them. It's preventing us from ever even thinking about wanting to reach out to them to try to provide some care and some support. I want to suggest to you that it's unlikely if you have an adult son or daughter who has rejected the Christian faith, the rejected the Christian life, it's unlikely that they have done so on purely intellectual grounds. Certainly, that's what some people claim. They say, well, the reason I'm not a Christian is because it conflicts with science, or I've now studied philosophy, or I've now studied world religions, or the Bible is just full of errors or whatever. But I mean, I've spent thousands of hours with uh, young people who used to be a part of church now who want nothing to do with it. And, and they, will, they will give me science reasons and philosophy reasons and political reasons and all those things. But at the end of the day, I think in every single one of those personal relationships that I've had, that the root issues were always about the heart. The, the root issues were not intellectual. The intellectual issues now are this sort of wrapping around the outside of their lack of faith or their uh, abandoning of, of Christianity. There were heart issues. There were heart wounds. There was heart trauma. There was uh, events that happened in their life that they simply could not reconcile with either God being there or God being loving. So I just want to encourage you uh, with that. I I don't think at the end of the day your son or daughter lost their way because of intellectual things, that their way was lost because of heart things, because of spiritual things. And having those intellectual conversations are helpful that they may be part of the path back. Uh, But at the end of the day, your son or daughter's under this major and ongoing spiritual attack. And at the end of the day, it's the transformation of their heart that's necessary. And that's something at the end of the day that only God can do. Well, let me talk to you about this next principle, drawing your child's heart to yours, drawing your child's heart to yours. The core concept here is that the shortest distance between your child's heart and Christ is you. The shortest distance between your child's heart and Christ is you. Maybe you've prayed, God, bring a friend or coworker into my son's life. Maybe he works in Phoenix, whatever. Uh, bring a son, bring a, a friend into my son's life today who would make a spiritual difference for him, someone who would invite him to church, someone who would share the gospel with him. Well, that's wonderful. That's a great prayer to pray that God would bring someone into his life but let's say that happens. Let's say God brings someone into his life, a coworker who is instrumental in, in his spiritual transformation. Praise God. Hallelujah. That'd be wonderful. But that would be like God bringing your son the long way around. In other words, he, he brought him uh, uh, to himself through a random coworker in Phoenix. Great. Praise God. I'll take it. The short route to Jesus is through you. The short route is through mom, through dad, where a parent asks for the heart of the child and the child gives the heart to the parent and the parent passes the heart to Jesus. That's the simple path. That's the simple route. And it's still the simple route. No one has more spiritual impact in the life of your child, no matter how old they are, than you. It's not too late for God to use you. Don't buy this lie that it's too late. Don't buy this lie that your window of influence has closed because it's not true. Proverbs 23, 26, one of our favorite scriptures here at VFM. Solomon's writing to his son and he says, my son, give me your heart. My son, give me your heart. In other words, let me into your life. And here's this principle that if we don't have heart connection with our adult kids, we're not going to have any influence with them. In other words, if you don't have relationship with your adult child, you're not going to have influence with them. Well, what do I mean by heart connection? Heart connection is when we have warmth, closeness, openness, honesty, and trust. Warmth, closeness, openness, honesty, and trust. When you have heart connection with someone, you have influence with them. If you don't have heart connection with them, you don't have influence with them. 
Let me give you a, a illustration. Let's imagine you have two neighbors. One neighbor is your very best friend in the whole wide world. You have warmth, closeness, openness, honesty, and trust. Your other neighbor, I don't know what his problem is, but he doesn't like you very much. And he's kind of a mean guy. Every time you come home, he mutters profanity. If he's outside raking or whatever, he mutters some profanity at you. He might throw some rocks at you from time to time, but pretty much can't stand you. So one day, sadly, you uh, get in a car accident on the way home from work and you limp your car back home into the driveway. And uh, the cantankerous neighbor comes out and says, hey, I see you wrecked your car. Now, he's already muttered his profanity at you and thrown some rocks, which is par for the course. I see you wrecked your car. Well, you need to take it down to, to Jones Body Shop. He's going to fix you up. Now, what's the chance of you going to Jones Body Shop? Pretty much zero. You're not going to listen to anything this guy has to say. Well, then your best friend comes out and says, hey, I see you wrecked your car. Are you okay? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm okay. Well, I'm glad you're okay. All right, you need to take it down to Jones Body Shop. They're going to fix you up. Well, now where are you going to go? You're going to go down to Jones Body Shop. So it turns out that your, your cantankerous neighbor, in a moment of kindness, uh, gave you some pretty good advice. Uh, but you're not going to listen to a word he has to say. Why? Because you don't have heart connection, warmth, closeness, openness, honesty, trust. And your neighbor, who's your best friend, all he had to say is, hey, go to Jones Body Shop. You go, yep, I'll go there. Why? Because you have heart connection. And with heart connection comes influence. How many of you would like to have more godly influence in the life of your adult child? Of course you would. I'm not talking about controlling our adult kids. It's not even possible. I'm talking about more godly influence. Well, if we want more godly influence, we are going to need more heart connection. We're going to need more relationship. We are going to have to try to rebuild some broken foundations with them. And we're going to have to build an adult-to-adult -adult relationship. This can't be a parent child relationship. All that's going to do is exasperate them and drive them further away. Let me give you some practical ways to, to rebuild this relationship. I mentioned uh, these questions uh, in our previous episode. Uh, how many of you were perfect parents? And you say, oh, no, not perfect. How many of you did some things wrong as a parent? Hopefully you're saying, yeah, I did some things wrong. We all fall short of the glory of God. And then I kind of pressed you a little bit and I said, well, like what? You know, what, what might have you done wrong? And, and hopefully some very specific things come to mind. Certain things come to my mind, things I'm struggling with now, not even past tense. And so whatever you might put on the list, areas of failure, areas of sin, areas of falling short, have you ever gone to your son or daughter to ask their forgiveness for those things? What a powerful thing to do to ask a son or daughter to forgive us. Flip it around. Imagine your 22-year-old daughter comes to you and says, hey, mom, uh, could we have breakfast tomorrow? And you say, yeah, sure. And you go out to breakfast and she says, you know, mom, I've been thinking. I, I think I've done some things that, um, that have really hurt you. And I remember when I said this, and I remember when I said this, and I remember when I did this back in high school, and, and I think that was wrong of me, and I, I think I really did damage to our relationship, and I want to ask you to forgive me. Wow. Do you think if your daughter were to do that, that it would increase or decrease heart connection? Well, obviously, it would increase it. Well, why would it increase it? It's because your daughter just used a biblical tool of, of just confession and asking forgiveness, and she brought it into your relationship. Have you ever done that to your kids? Have you ever gone to them and said, I'm sorry? Will you forgive me? Now, some of you are saying, Rob, I have done it. Believe me. I've written it. I've said it. I've done it 10 times. Well, if that's the case, I would probably counsel you not to do it an 11th time. Here's what I mean. Sometimes a child refuses to forgive a parent because they're using it as a power play. In other words, they'll forgive you when they think you have sufficiently flagellated yourself. When you feel sufficiently bad for what you did in their eyes, then they will be good enough to grant you forgiveness. Now, sometimes apologizing for something two or three times, if it's a big deal, is very, very appropriate. And whenever you ask forgiveness from a child or from anyone, I think it's helpful to say, hey, listen, I, I want to ask you to forgive me. I'm not asking you to answer right now. You, you may need time to think about this or process this or pray about this, but I, I genuinely want to ask for your forgiveness. 
Well, we're going to continue this conversation in our next episode and in part three of this series on on reaching prodigals, that it's never too late. Again, I want to encourage you to pick up this book, Never Too Late, Encouraging Faith in Your Adult Child, anywhere you buy your books and this video Bible study. This is a great way to do a deep dive into this conversation with friends, with friends from church in a small group. That video Bible study is available with a workbook on our website at visionaryfam.com. That's visionaryfam.com. And if you have a family member who's far from God and you'd like us to help you pray for them, please send us that prayer request at podcast at visionaryfam.com, podcast at visionaryfam.com. And as always, it means the world to us that you're spending this time with us here as a part of the Family Vision community. And we look forward to our next time with you on Family Vision.